Okay, so we should be live. Um, why is it not showing us in the little webcam? Why not? Is that the viewing angle? I don't know if they can see us or not. I know. That's Hello, everyone. Welcome. We're going to start in one minute. It'd be nice if we could like turn it for once we're doing the other stuff so people can see. Thank you. Hello, everyone, and welcome. And welcome to you people who are hopefully joining us via Google Hangouts uh, right now. Um, I'm Lori Taylor, and this is. Hello, I'm Aaron Beveridge. Uh, and today we're talking about professional web presence, personal sites, and online portfolios. So just to let you know, this is being broadcast via Google Hangouts. So we have some other people joining us there. And that means that this will be, because it's a Google Hangout on air, um, this is being automatically recorded to YouTube. So the video of this will also be available. Um, a lot of this is you know, time hands-on with us floating around to help people get set up. Um, so that part won't be available, but um, uh, the video of this will be available on Google Hangouts. And yeah. So uh, today we're talking about um, a professional web presence, um, reasons to do it, and um, we'll have hands-on time for doing it. Um, at the end of this, we'll also have uh, a couple of mentions on upcoming workshops on WordPress and on the IR, the Institutional Repository at UF, which are other things that can support your professional web presence. And I think the handout, the sign-in sheet is going around. So, it is. OK. Um, <laughs> so some of the reasons um, to have a professional uh, web presence, to be findable, to be contactable, um, and to have it connectable um, in terms of your, your human and your social networks, uh, for collaborative projects, for conference panels, uh, for potential students and colleagues to be able to find you and reach out to you. And some of the things to think about in this process include controlling your identity, how you want to link to Facebook and other sites, um, how you want to limit access, or how you want to exist in the online uh, world. Um, other reasons are connecting to different tools. Google profiles are necessary for connecting to things like Google Hangouts, which we're using today. And we're also talking about minimal levels of effort. So if you connect all of these online sites together, you're more findable. And it also means uh, less work overall on maintaining. You decide not to maintain one link them all together. Okay. So we'll start with looking at Google Profile. So um, for those of you who, how many of you have a Google account or a Google Profile already set up? Okay, so those of you who don't, you may want to consider doing that at this time because this, the nice thing about the Google Profile and, and 
part of the concept in controlling the identity is deciding whether you want some of these academic social networks to be alternatives to your Facebook or Twitter presence, ones that may be more personal, or whether you want to link them all together. So for me, I use the Google Plus profile as more of my professional social network that all these other ones link to, whereas some people may use their Facebook or Twitter. So that some of that might be determined based on how you use your Facebook and Twitter. You know, some people use them professionally, other people use them to connect with family and friends and those things. So uh, Google Profile is a nice alternative. So I have up the Google Scholar page, but really once you have that Google account set up, that sort of links out from there with all the rest. So um, I'll go to my Google Plus page. As you can see here, uh, it's, it's sort of an alternative to Facebook. Most of you who have a Google account may be familiar with this. Uh, Google sets this up automatically for you if you have a Google account. So if you go to plus.google.com and you log into with your Google ID, it will bring up a page for you. So can some, can some people try that now and see if that works for them? Yes, plus.google.com. If you look right up here, it's probably too small to see. But, um, and we'll start with that because the, the next site that will link off this Academia EDU will actually pull from your Google profile to build it out quite nicely. So, uh, But you can also use your Facebook account um, for Academia EDU as well. Yep. And you see it's very basic, so you can go in and start adding photos and show yourself. You already have a photo, which is nice. And which, so what you'll see if you bring it up, it'll automatically pull whatever photo you may have already associated with Gmail, which will be nice. But you may want to choose a different photo, depending on how you want it to populate other things. So, yeah. Yes. Okay, so go <laughs> So yeah, Google is good about cross pollinating all of its data. Unfortunately, it may pull personal data that you prefer to have. Yeah, so if you go to your bio, please. Google stuff for school. I just wanted to connect to my email. Yeah, so what you can do is you can connect it to a different email account. Yeah. So or, or you can make for Facebook too. Twice. So um, just to okay. say it for the Google Hangouts as well. So um, two people have already remarked that, oh, I logged into my my Google or my Gmail account for Google Plus and it brought up my personal account. So that's not what I want. I want to have a separation. And that's one of the reasons the pre work for this are is really important, both having the image you want to have online, your CV, and deciding what you don't want to have online or how you don't want things connected and how you do. So you can create a separate account, a separate Gmail address, and a separate Google Plus for professional things if you don't want them mixed. And Aaron has a good example of um, he has things separated. I, everything's mixed online. Uh, my whole professional identity is the same as my personal. Um, when my mother-in-law posts to Facebook, I'm like, what is she doing? This is work related. Doesn't she understand? Um, my mother-in-law is totally lovely. Um, we talk about um, gators and football together. Um, but it's a good example because my 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 web presence is very much my professional web presence, whereas Aaron has a different experience. Yeah, I'm trying to keep them separate, but I'm finding that these things want to bleed so much that it, it becomes difficult, right? It's kind of a, uh, a conservation, if you will, really trying to figure out how to keep one from bleeding the other. Google's been nice because with Google+, Plus. Um, it's really primary function for professionalizing I have found is really for the collaborative work. So if you keep it attached to a personal email, which I have mine, I don't have it attached to my UFL email just because um, I don't really email from this account. I really use it for what we're using it for today, right? So sharing over the web, it's collaborative video function works as well as any of the others. It's not perfect, but it's screen sharing feature is also nice. So like, I'm collaborating on an article with um, a friend at Clemson, and we're using this quite often and have found it very useful. So it really sort of comes back to how you want it to connect to the other sites. So um, with a lot of these sites, you can keep them separate, 
but the problem with keeping them separate is you have to maintain them separate. So it's really sort of a balance issue, right? If you want them to be connected, then it's hard to sort of avoid the crossover. If you want to keep them separate, then you have to maintain them separately. So it's, it, it's hard to sort of figure out the exact math for that, but it really depends on how much bleed over you want to allow. So does that make sense? So, yeah. yeah, yeah. So does everyone have at least a Google Plus video? Mine is asking my question was what are the options of what, what is the benefit of doing Google Plus like what does that allow you to link to for instance that Facebook would not allow you to do? okay so um, so that's a great question. What does Google Plus allow you to link to that Facebook doesn't allow you to link to? So some of the reasons, just get back a little bit, um, what the purpose of this, um, this uh, hands-on workshop training session is to give you a quick and easy way to have a professional web presence. So you can definitely do a lot more. Um, and we mentioned that, oops. so we do have um, future trainings coming up on having WordPress and using the IRUF. But this particular training, um, the benefit of having a Google profile is a lot of people are on Google, so it's very connectable. It also enables you to do things like to use a Google Hangouts. Without Google profile, you can't use um, Google Hangouts. A Google profile is also connected to Google Scholar citations, so that automatically feeds and connects to that. Also, you can use your same Google login to sign into academia.edu, and it will pre-populate your photo and some other information. So you can build and you can chain all of these together, so you, you don't have to re-enter your name and your photo and all of your information as many times. Um, whatever selection of things you choose to use, one of the things that we recommend is connecting them together. So make links and references over to the other accounts so that you don't have to maintain all of them. So doing the different connecting so you don't have to maintain across different ones. And Google Profile is just a very useful one for doing some of that connecting. Um, some of the others that are very useful, Google Scholar Citations, Academia, EDU, uh, LinkedIn, which is where a lot of people will look for you. Zotero is something you can link to the rest of them. It's a citation uh, management system, and it allows you to do things like Zotero groups. So it allows you to connect with people and to leverage that for your own personal benefit in terms of building your community. So for some, some of you, you may want to skip the Google Plus and go straight to Academia EDU, um, depending on how you want it, because some of you aren't wanting it to connect to your personal Gmail account, which is perfectly fine. That's again where it's sort of how you want this information to cross over depends on that. So with Academia EDU, you can just use your UFL email to set it up. For me, the nice thing, as Lori explained, was that when I used my Google account, it brought over automatically my photo and my university affiliation and some of those things. So, but what I did was, is rather than editing Google+, Plus, which I use primarily for collaboration, I went ahead and let it sort of set up some of the basic info for me to speed up the process. And then I did the professional editing in Academia EDU, which is where uh, most of my sort of professional level connecting will occur um, in terms of spreading my work and my CV and whatnot. How does this um, differ from LinkedIn or what are what's the So Academia.edu is a professional um, website system and paper sharing resource um, specifically targeted to academics, which is great. So Academia.edu is going to be one of the top things that you definitely want as someone who works in academia as an academic. You want to have a presence on Academia.edu. One of the things that I've often come across, um, Academia.edu is totally awesome. Not all people in all professions that relate to academia um, use academia.edu as a primary dog and use LinkedIn. In many businesses, LinkedIn is primary. You also want to have some sort of presence on LinkedIn because so often people who are organizing conferences, who are looking for guest speakers, who are looking for plenary speakers, looking for keynotes, they're often looking for who's in this city, um, looks like maybe they'll be available on this date, um, and is on this topic. So one of the things that I get a lot of questions um, on our people who are doing conference planning, they're about to go into a meeting. Hey, Lori, do you know anyone who's in New York? Do you know anyone who's in San Diego? Do you know anyone who's attending the ALA conference or this other conference on these dates um, who might be able to speak on X? That's, um, I've had half a dozen or more calls on that, 
And that's, it's great that they're calling you, that's really nice. Um, I know lots of us get calls like that, but it's not great because the reason they're calling is they, they can't find people. And they should be able to find them. Sometimes they're only like checking LinkedIn, sometimes they're checking academia.edu. Sometimes they're doing a Google search, which doesn't pick up a lot of our directory information, a lot of things on academic websites or on university websites. So putting these out there ensure you're more visible, you're more findable. So doing both is not an or the other. In terms, if if I were to guess at a hierarchy, um, in terms of importance of maintenance, academia edu, at least in terms of today, may be one of the most important because of what it does in terms of possibly citation and professionalism and whatnot. Because um, we have a couple articles here. Um, there's one example here where um, a professor recently beat out Steven Pinker for the, the most followers on Academia EDU, and he's actually using that as an argument for receiving tenure based on how much he's been able to network and collaboratively publish and whatnot, and it just shows to where uh, Academia EDU's ability to track citations and to uh, connect people based on their research and their papers they're produce, producing or may want to produce uh, provides sort of a unique experience in that sort of way. So in terms of helping us get work done, it may be, um, the most important social network among these for that specific purpose. So there was also um, another article connected to that about um, using academia edu to increase the amount you may be cited in papers and uh, really good arguments on how to sort of use it when you cite yourself but also in terms of um, using it as a way of sort of getting your work out there and and people could sometimes criticize these things for the wrong sort of professionalism but to the extent that it can be promoting greater collaboration, greater interdisciplinary work, and those sorts of things, it really is sort of a, a good way of seeing it as, as helping us extend our work and extending the people that we work with in our field. So um, those are two examples of really how Academia EDU is sort of set apart in helping us get work done. So, um, And some of these things are great reminders um, for how we do research. I mean, we do research to build on existing knowledge and then connect out to and build for the possibilities of future knowledge. Um, and some of the research, um, women are cited less often um, in research papers, and a lot of that, um, the vast majority of that is due to women citing themselves less often. Um, and that's common across all, uh, you know, across all fields. And it's a really weird factor. So we cite ourselves less often um, if we're female researchers. That's weird. Um, and it's problematic because when you see that citation rankings are some of the ways that we determine things like impact, um, uh, researcher you know, quality, excellence level. And so some of this, the professionalization, the networking, uh, helps remind us of things that we need to do, like self-citation, and also helps connect us to our communities to demonstrate some of the things like uh, broader impacts. So in terms of looking at Academia EDU right away, um, you know, obviously I've uploaded my CV here, um, which, uh, oh, there it populated nicely. So um, that is right there, readily viewable, which is nice in terms of helping collaboration. But it really centers around um, adding papers in, um, which I haven't done this step yet because I'm just starting to really use Academia EDU myself. Um, and I haven't published yet. Um, I have conference papers, but I'm, um, working collaboratively right now with someone. So in the, that extent, it's really about sort of once you start publishing to find ways of sort of building off that momentum and getting more collaborative work done and finding other people who may want to use your work and other people who do similar work. So really that the central point for Academia EDU is really like those papers and that, that being a starting point for, you know, it's similar with Facebook, how you have the feed, right? The feed for Academia EDU is is the papers, which is pretty interesting that a, a social network is built around that work. So, wouldn't you particularly want to put in conference papers that aren't published? Absolutely. Published paper publications and they're out there already. So, if you look at my feed, um, you'll see lots of people who are putting up. Uh, papers, graduate students who are putting up papers from courses they're working on, looking for people who are interested in collaborating to get to an end publishable piece, people who are just throwing up ideas, so, and then people who are actually getting to the full level of, I just published this, check it out, cite it, whatever. So, yes, it, it, it sort of works for the whole, the full spectrum of, of developing an idea to showing the, the, the completed product, so. It, sorry, go ahead. Oh, so one of the other um, uh, citations or reference um, things that uh, Aaron had brought up was on um, the takedown notices for academia.edu. 
one of the things that's going to happen with any system, um, there are always going to be problems, and with social networks, it's always complicated. Some of the complication is deciding on your professional identity versus your personal identity, how you have things linked. Some of it are um, a interesting in different ways that rely you to or that um, reinforce the importance and the value of linking across different sites. Um, the IR at UF is available for you to share your research, your conference papers, your materials for um, University of Florida uh, people um, and others have similar repositories as well, uh, which is very useful because if someone issues a Digital Millennium Copyright Act takedown notice saying, hi, I'm the publisher, that's my paper, it's not yours, you author scholar, um, you have to take it down. Um, the University of Florida is the one that responds to those. And the University of Florida is prepared um, and would be happy to engage in a lengthy discussion or battle on author rights, scholar rights, and our roles in making our research available. Um, for academia.edu, a lot of people got takedown notices from the journal publisher Elsevier saying, uh, this is file sharing, you're, public, you're putting out uh, versions of the articles that you should not be putting out. That also hit a number of many, many different listeners in the libraries, and a lot of the academic deans um, and directors of different libraries were talking to their people, have you gotten a copyright um, uh, takedown notice? Uh, so what's going on with it? Let's make sure that your research is still available. So directing people over to their repositories reinforces the value and importance of your repository. Always super useful. Academia.edu reinforces the importance and the value of it as well in terms of it being a place where people go to find research, so much so that they got bulk takedown notices. We're still doing the overview part. We're, we'll get to have all hands on where Aaron and I are walking around shortly. But feel free to be logging into some of these sites if you're comfortable doing so. We're in a computer classroom. Um, Aaron and I are both comfortable with you guys typing away while we're talking. So we'll do one last overview here with LinkedIn before we go to Z Zotero, which is sort of, it, it connects to groups, but it's more of a bottom up. This is actually a tool you can use for research that you can then collaborate with. So we'll, we'll show the LinkedIn one, and then we'll come around and help everyone for a while. And then we'll save the Zotero and IR at US for last. So um, LinkedIn um, is very similar to the other two we've seen. So you can either use something else to log into it. Well, Google only wants you to use Google to log into them. But um, Academia EDU, you can use Facebook. Um, or you can log in with using an email ad account that you're comfortable with. Uh, in this case, you probably want to use your UFL email, similar to what you would use with Academia EDU. But again, if, if you have a more professional Facebook, then it may be easier to just link right to that, and it'll pull all the content in for you. So again, to the extent that your, your um, social network is personal versus professional, that's up to you to decide. So um, I'll go ahead and log into mine here. LinkedIn, so what you see when you first log into LinkedIn is LinkedIn's feed updates thing. Um, LinkedIn can be a little jarring for a lot of people who are, wait a minute, how is this research related? There's some ads, it, it can seem strange. Um, it's really heavily used in the business community, uh, many business communities, um, and, and in academia. So it's useful, um, it's definitely a useful site to have a presence on. I wanted to think, so Aaron created your account when last night? Yeah. Um, and so someone has been, has already looked at his page. Um, from Clemson, so yeah. the Jason Thatcher, if you have her down. Yeah. Um, so it, we're not clear on if this is because he's collaborating with someone at Clemson who has been talking about his research, if it, um, it's because he's got the MassMine, um, which is MassMine.org, um, open source software for data mining, if that person heard about it and then Googled him and found it. Um, but so he already knows that someone is looking at him, which is really nice, someone relevant to and someone connected to another institution that he's connected to. So this one, I have done less to fill this out because I'm using it this one in the way sort of Lori imagined in terms of making sure to have this out there as just an extra connection point. So I'll probably spend the most time on really filling out my Academia EDU page, um, especially as I hopefully publish here soon. So, um, but so that one's going to be really my center point, and whereas LinkedIn is just going to be an extra contact point, I'll probably maintain this one the least of them personally. Um, but whereas someone on the job market may see LinkedIn as the one they maintain the most, and they're going to sort of um, do it equally with their academia edu page. So again, you know, where you judge the importance of these things depends on how you see them being useful. So for me, it's an extra contact point. For someone else, it may be where they need to put all their focus currently. So, um, yeah. Is there a way 
choosing two LinkedIn um, accounts. Um, in terms of, do you have one that was purely business related before? Maybe is that what you're wondering? I, I, I can speak to you after after the workshop, but I have two accounts, and I've been able to figure out how to merge those two. Interesting. Oh, that's, that's a good question. That's a good question. I have not yeah. encountered anyone with two LinkedIn accounts, so we will investigate that in the hands-on time, and we'll learn together. Are they connected to two separate emails? Two separate emails. Okay, yeah, that's a good question. Um, yeah, so I, I guess we can actually start working on this stuff now because that was all I had to say about LinkedIn. Did you have anything else for LinkedIn? Uh, so it looks like Richard has a question, cool. then you're going to talk about Zotero. Oh, okay, yes. cool. Yeah, I'm trying to um, create the account for academia, and it wants my department, but it doesn't have libraries. And it insists you put something. You should be able to type it in. I found libraries. I guess I found uh, special collections. Yeah, I can just start typing in special. So there's more to use that. Yeah. Library. So this is a reason to cover all of these different things, and I, I know it's sort of a lot from the top. Okay, everyone, we're giving you a broad overview, and then we'll do hands-on on it. A lot of the, because it is best to have multiple sites set up and then to have them linked together, that's kind of a clunky process with slightly different interfaces, different benefits if you do them in different orders. Um, so we'll be in the hands-on officially in a moment. Um, but first, cool. Zotero. Yeah, so Z I first found Zotero wanting a way of managing all of my sources and references for research and for a way of quickly saving them when I was online. Um, but what it also affords, and the reason why it's part of today's discussion, um, is that it allows for working with sets of citations and research projects in groups where those citations you're collecting and that research you're collecting can be worked with in a social function through the internet. So. Lori can explain the U. We actually have one already for the Digital Humanities Working Group through UF um, with UFDHWG is the way to find it. If you go to Zotero.com, or I'm sorry, Zotero.org, and you click on Groups, and you search for Groups, what is it? DH dash. Okay. And you type in UF dash DHWG. That's the Zotero working group for the Digital Humanities Working Group at UF. And what is your name under? Mine is probably that. Oh, wait, I'm under group still. Oh, you know what? Mine's probably private stuff. Oh, okay. So you can keep you can keep your research private too. What you can do is go in. You can eventually you like so with all this. This is my whole library of stuff I've collected. Um, and what's nice about Zotero, um, just to give you an example. So let's say I'm on Amazon, um, which is, Amazon's book function is really nice and how it sort of. Its algorithm will link you to other books you didn't expect, but sometimes when I'm doing research, I'll be reading a book, and I don't want to mess with having to copy all the exact citations, right? So what you can do in Zotero, I'm trying to think of a book I don't have in there. Um, give me uh, a rant. Programmed Visions. Okay, there we go. And it's a good one. It's by Wendy um, uh, Wendy Chen, who is coming here uh, in December to give a presentation as part. Of, oh, yeah, Sarah's already raised her hand on that. Sarah knows all about it. Okay, so if you look, Zotero automatically puts this little link right here. And what's beautiful is, is that all I have to do is click that, and I'll get a little notification in the bottom right, saving to my library. And now all the source and citation information for that book is saved. And it takes, when I'm done writing a paper, some people, if you've all been here before, you've written a paper, how long does it take you to write the reference, bibliography, works cited page? For me, it takes me less than five minutes to literally just spit it out, double check that it looks correct, and I'm done. Because what Zotero does is it literally, let's see, where is that in here now? The other thing that Zotero does, where so it's pulling it in, um, and so he's got it, so there it's easy it for his research. Because we're talking about low maintenance ways to still have a professional web presence and have it connect out. The reason I asked Aaron for his username and I pulled out my iPad, 
uh, was so that I could search for him and then I could follow him. Now, when I follow people, that means that I get informed whenever they add something to it. I'm like, oh, you're reading program visions? That's cool. I want to talk to you about that. I wonder what you're researching. Or, oh, I should read that too. Click save. So now I've saved the citation, but I've also seen what he's researching that ties into his research. So what he's reading, what he's doing. Um, I follow a lot of people this way. You can also subscribe to people's RSS feeds through Zotero. Um, and you can then use those RSS feeds to embed on your site. You can show people what you're reading. It's a great way to share with students what you're reading. Um, it's also a great way to sort of be connected to your distributed networks. There are a number of um, collaborators that I've had since grad school, and I don't really follow them on Facebook because normally that's I mean, I check in because I want to see how their families are doing. That's more of the personal stuff with their kids and their dogs. Um, but Zotero gives me a sense of what they're doing professionally. And so that's one of the things that I look to follow. Another another nice aspect of Zotero is um, sharing. A lot of times, have you ever shared docu documents on Google Docs, right? Has anyone ever done this, worked collaboratively for that? So Zotero can save notes. And so um, with if you have a collaborative folder of research you're working on with someone else, you can link those notes directly into Zotero and click them and it brings it right up and I can start writing on my notes here and it saves and it's always there in one central place. So, and then I can share the link on this document with other collaborators and now we're, we're sharing in one place uh, at multiple angles. So we're sharing on the, the collection of the resources and then our thoughts and notes about them and then you can easily, you know, start to, uh, collate all of those notes and then you have your sort citations and you, you're spitting out a first draft just based on how you're coming at the research process differently. So, um, so yeah. Yeah. So we're going to switch back over to the slides. Um, oh, there's Google Hangouts blinking at us. Um, hopefully people are sharing your screen. Good. Hopefully everyone is still seeing that. Um, great. Um, and so next slide. Um, so we do have um, future workshops that are upcoming. Um, we're making sure that we're still sharing our screen sharing present to everyone. That should be interesting. Okay, so this is our first time using Google Hangouts um, for a presentation, so we're hoping that it's good everywhere. We are sorry if it's not. Um, the slides are online, and now we are moving into the hands-on workshop part of the time, so Aaron and I are going to be floating around. Um, I don't know how much this mic will pick up, if anything. Uh, so for those of us who have joined, the eight people who have joined us remotely, thank you for joining us. Um, and if you can still hear, that would be really neat. We're going to still try it for recording, but it may not. Um, so we're moving into hands-on time, but do please email us if you have questions um, or if we can help further after this. So you may not hear us. You may hear us. Um, we'll How's everyone? Yeah, so now we're gonna float around. I don't think the mic will pick up everyone, but it might, or I might run back to it. Okay. I was just like, well, I should probably change the picture, but I can't, but I get image mess with it right now. <laughs> A good, a good professional picture. Just well, I feel like I keep having like my wife do smartphone photos and trying to edit them. Or like, I just need someone who actually is a photographer. One headshot. So I have a question about I guess about LinkedIn, which I can't quite get to right now. But um, when I, for instance, I haven't used it very much. I have 54 people who have invited me to connect with them. Yes. I mean, who are the people that you should connect with? Who should you kind of? So these are people who have already had their email address. Okay. And when you put in how LinkedIn works, when you put in your email address, it pulls all your contacts out of my phone. So that's how they they may have. They just it was actually it was not them inviting you to the system. LinkedIn is it's a better way to go through and connect all of them, or is it better to be selective? I, if, I mean, I don't. The, the question is, so how do you manage your personal online presence? If, if, if you're professional everywhere, I think you just connect to everybody because you never know how how it is. But for me, I'm been trying to sort of balance all the online presence. Three years, I should have asked again. So I may just sort of yeah. delete everything and go professional for a while. So well, I know with. Um, 
I haven't, I've used Facebook somewhat where people, I know I have a lot of professional links in there, I haven't, but I've noticed a lot of people, you know, just either, I even have some endorsements on LinkedIn, and I haven't really developed my profile there, but obviously it could do well for me if I did, I just, Oh, of course. Yes. The hardest question for this is how much of your stuff do you want to cross off? How much do you want to cross off of this? That's the one I would show. I'm going to try to have Google Plus be my professional Facebook. It's not too personal. But the problem is, I have a lot of professional friends that have conferences. Well, I talk to you on Facebook, so I'll post it. LinkedIn, to me, is sort of uh, um, the one that's more about getting a job and more connected to your resume and those kinds of things. I can believe it's more of a collaborative. Yeah, if I had to differentiate, but there's probably plenty of people using it. Because <laughs> <laughs> it has those yeah, things. Yeah. 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 I haven't, I, I just signed up for an account and I haven't started to be used, so we'll see how that goes. Yeah. <laughs> if that goes well. Um, there, there are always someone who can involve for us. I'm giving you a false choice. Yeah. Okay. A false choice for you. connect with but, Facebook, um, but the reason or I don't have an account. The reason yeah. is, yeah. it doesn't no. say, so this is the first thing that I've ever seen. Yeah, so we employ the research and comments. So, my computer just keeps reading out, and then it decides it's not working out. Like, yeah, it's, it's really, it's, uh, that's where the whole tracking of you is about how much you're going to so, uploading papers, or, you know, kind of keeping an eye on the feed occasionally to see if there's people who might want to try to buy with. It's sort of centered on that. From what I think. You can use your contacts. You can use Facebook, you can use email or Twitter. I think email is probably the safest because you can use, you know, more your contacts from. Um, I the problem, the part of the problem right now is that we just changed their email system. So we're through Outlook. We've always been through Outlook. You guys did that. Oh, you guys are still, um, wait, the English department is separate on this? Um, uh, we've been through a lot of people on campus to change uh, the website. You guys are on the cloud outlook is what we have. We know. That, oh, that didn't go, that didn't mm -hmm. get distributed outside yet. We're not on outlook, we're on outlook. Yes, that's what we used to be on. I think we are in the pilot program. I thought we were rolling it out. Oh, well, then I, I don't know what I'm talking about. I need help on this one. So why? So we don't support it? Okay, that makes sense. So, um, but once you log in, um, so have you created an account? Yeah, I'm in my call now. But it won't allow me in where I was trying to find you. That's what's a good one. Um, yeah, I managed to get on. I just have to manage that. I found the Yeah, so I. Um, yes, okay. So, one of the other things. Is that um, okay, so Gmail is always going to let you. It'll actually let you have a new citation. Okay, yeah, so you're right there. Yeah, great. Yeah, that'll let you. Um, a lot of people will use yeah, it. I think you just make it like a name. Yeah. 
So one of the things that came up, and hopefully this is still working, um, when you post your materials to the IR, you can use, you can, you can easily add the materials from the IR directly to academia.edu by using the permanent links. Are you doing what? The permanent links from the IR items. So, hopefully this shows. Okay. So if you have materials that are if you have materials that are already in the IR, when you add a paper, you add another material, there is a way to do it um, where you just add the information. So instead of dragging and dropping, you can add the title, you can add an abstract so that it's more indexed, indexable and findable in Academia EDU, and you add the permanent link, and then your materials are there, but you're using the materials already in the IR, so you're not loading it twice. Yeah. And Dan had the question and Bonnie had the question, so if two people have the question, it means it's a question to share. Um, I am going to stop the um, the Google Hangouts. Uh, thank you, everyone who attended via Google Hangouts. I just I don't think you guys can, I don't think uh, uh, folks attending via Google Hangouts can hear us. So I'm going to stop screen sharing and then I'm going to stop the broadcast. But thank you. Aaron, you're